I am Patrick Higgins, uh, consulting fisheries biologist since 1989, and now the managing director of the Eel River Recovery Project. And the Eel River Recovery Project has been in existence since uh, 2011, and it became its own 501c3 in 2016. Our mission is to help the citizens of the eel, to take the pulse of the eel through citizen monitoring, to uh, properly analyze those results, uh, to share them collaboratively with agencies, tribes, and other NGOs, and to uh, help the citizens of the eel understand the condition of their watershed. Uh, and we are uh, science-based, but we're also non-advocacy. We're solutions-based. So we're always kind of trying to analyze things and feed the community uh, the information that it needs. And this is uh, kind of our blueprint. We work on solutions, not advocacy. Don't get involved in lawsuits or things that are highly controversial. We scope the community to a series of public meetings. Our most recent, January 14, 2017, uh, we did our uh, scoping in Willits, which is in the southern end of the 3,600 square mile watershed. So we try to move our meetings annually around to make sure that we're really in touch with the needs of the diverse community of the eel. After we identify needs, we find resources to solve problems or to start proje projects. Then we pull those projects off and we share uh, results back with the community. And our, uh, our motto is engage, enlighten, and empower. And the second part of that would be scientific truth with no judgment. We do not assign blame or causal mechanisms if we find ecological conditions impaired. Instead, we share information back with the community so that they can help work with their neighbors to abate the problem. So we started uh, under trees. And Trees Foundation in Garberville is just an integral part of the nonprofit scene on the North Coast. And they said, well, Pat, you know, people do want to monitor. And uh, this is an open niche. And so why don't you just begin to operate under our umbrella? Uh, so you could go online and you could read this little treatise, which defines uh, our objectives. And we've been merrily carrying them out since 2011. Uh, then we also... Uh, had uh, our kickoff meetings. Uh, the Bill Graham Memorial Foundation, uh, Rock Impresario, has left some money, and uh, his heirs and some of the folks who work with them uh, disperse uh, philanthropic uh, grants to small groups, and we conducted uh, scoping sessions in the Eel in 2011 in Fortuna, Redway Garberville, and in Willits, and we asked the public what they thought about the condition of the eel and uh, what we might uh, try to help them understand better. And we also explained that there were tens of thousands of Chinook salmon. The eel is a resilient ecosystem, uh, but at the same time, it can cure your dog in 15 minutes in different places, so that's a real paradox. Uh, we went into retreat after the scoping meetings, and three dozen people showed up in the middle of nowhere, a beautiful place, Emmendahl, uh, east of Willits, and they all listen to what the citizens of the basin had requested, and we formed committees. It was uh, a real epiphany for me. I had uh, never had six, such success as an organizer, and um, the energy from that retreat still resonates. And annually we reiterate it through, uh, through scoping, and uh, it's, it's working quite well. And a lot of the problems in the eel are assigned to the marijuana uh, cannabis industry, and uh, there is some merit uh, to that assignation. So uh, from the start, we begin with um, education on how to conserve water, how to avoid pollution, and uh, this has actually was manifest through uh, what was known as Water Days, and we uh, held these Water Day events 2012, 2013, uh, and 2014. And uh, they drew hundreds uh, in the community of Southern Humboldt, which is the center of the cannabis culture, the Emerald Triangle. But we really didn't feel like it was changing behaviors. But uh, we are still kind of in a public education mode and holding meetings almost constantly throughout the basin on different themes. And let's see. I'm skipping over, double-clicking. This is like a Water Day agenda. 
So uh, we also got uh, many businesses throughout uh, the Eel River Basin, and particularly in Southern Humboldt, where we're hosting these events, and other nonprofits to uh, to support the endeavor, so that it was really community wide. And that's one thing the Recovery Project really tries to do. We try to collaborate and not compete with other NGOs, and to uh, and to really make sure that um, we're we're occupying a niche that's largely one that's otherwise unfilled. And we work with an indigenous community. There's quite a few uh, indigenous people in the eel. Uh, they are centered in Round Valley, one of the larger California Indian reservations in the middle fork of the eel, and traditionally uh, nonprofit organizations in uh, the Eel River Basin have not done very much out in Covalo. And that's where the Round Valley Indian Reservation is. And we have an active education committee. We are in the grammar schools out there. Uh, we are also uh, holding uh, salmon awareness festivals in cooperation with the Round Valley tribes that both uh, teach best practices to folks uh, and also uh, celebrate native culture. And we um, really, my belief is that the Indians had it right. If you're good to nature, nature's going to reward you. You work against nature, nature's going to play tricks on you. And uh, so I think that we have a great deal to learn from the indigenous peoples about the management of the landscape. And indeed, the Recovery Project wishes to join with them in uh, getting them established as co-managers uh, in public lands on the east side of the basin. And uh, so our monitoring began uh, in 2012 and uh, kind of on a shoestring budget. We did fall Chinook, water temperature, and started to look at toxic algae, but not in a very sophisticated way. There's two driving hypotheses in terms of the Eel River Recovery Project's water quality and algae studies. And uh, we like to go at hypotheses and kind of uh, use the methods of science to determine things so that the community is satisfied because if you're always arguing, is there a problem or isn't there, then you never get anywhere. So our number one hypothesis was that the Eel River uh, is decreasing in flow due to changes in land use. And these seem contemporaneous with the uh, legalization of marijuana. And a smaller volume of water will heat up more rapidly. And so lower flows also have longer transit time. So we begin immediately to measure water temperature as a surrogate for flow, because measuring flow is actually a very complicated and costly endeavor. And so secondarily, uh, we uh, form the hypothesis that flow depletion and nutrient enrichment was uh, responsible for the toxic algae problem. So we started to study that uh, and uh, try to test that, uh, that hypothesis. And uh, we love to have our partners. Uh, many are out in the hills. Uh, they're deep thinkers. Uh, they have a lot of time on their hands. Uh, they have uh, been uh, very, very good observers of nature. And they are highly amused uh, and uh, enriched by uh, having uh, science partners out there with them. And uh, these are the different folks in different years that we've allied with, and we have uh, dozens and dozens of people that we monitor water temperature with. We have another, you know, 100 that participate in our fall Chinook, and so we really are involving people uh, throughout the basin, and this is our 2015 list of volunteers. There's some overlap. People come back year after year, but there's also people that come on and then um, remain. In 2013, you can see where we uh, monitor temperature in the Eel River Basin, but now we have uh, more fully occupied many of the sites. And this is a graphic from our 2016 study for the State Regional Water Quality Control Board, and you can see that uh, we actually accumulated 14 million data points that have been collected since 1980. The Recovery Project is uh, re responsible for about 500 data sets. We put out about uh, 100 water temperature gauges this year. So uh, it's a real challenge to keep up with the trap line, uh, but it yields a tremendous amount of information, and we're going to stay on this and try to get uh, more money for kind of a power analysis of all the data we've accumulated. Um, and actually in that last graphic, you can kind of see where the Salmonids have traditionally been concentrated in the basin along the west side. And that actually also happens to be coincident with the, the heart of the marijuana culture. So uh, there's, uh, there's an awful lot that you can uh, figure out from looking at patterns at the scale. 
And so water temperature data is collected in a, in a very standard method. Uh, there were studies in the basin as far back as 1995, 1996 by the Humboldt County Resource Conservation District, and they were at, occupied uh, 235 locations uh, in conjunction with timber companies and federal and state agencies. Uh, and so uh, that's our objective is to get back into that uh, same footprint so that we have a, a way to uh, essentially take the pulse of the eel and this is just kind of uh, the metadata for what to do in terms of temperature probes. The North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board lends us probes, uh, uses our data. Uh, they utilize them for trend analysis and TMDL compliance. So we are a very uh, gracious and willing and uh, lucky partner to have the North Coast Regional Board. And uh, here's uh, Stephanie Stefano Davis, school teacher with her son, John Henry. We're putting a water temperature gauge in. Uh, John Henry's taking a look at the fish. Um, we have a lot of fun out there. This is Proud Savage on Chemise Creek. And uh, Chemise Creek is an interesting one east of Garberville. And even when it dries up, the pools remain cold enough to sustain steelhead. And as a matter of fact, when the creek is disconnected, all the water comes out of the gravel bar and the pools get colder. Uh, Chemise is a high value target for us in terms of organizing people for water conservation and pollution prevention, and one of the places we hope to focus with education to get it back on the surface uh, in average flow years and to help it uh, continue in its arc of recovery. It's a steelhead refugia because it's too steep for the non-native invasive pike minnow. And Bear Creek in 1997, it had been torrented because of timber activities by Maxam Corporation. By 2012, it had decreased by 15 degrees C. Our, our, uh, Fahrenheit, rather, and uh, had uh, improved considerably, uh, but sediment oversupply continues to be a problem in the basin in terms of water quality. Uh, as we go out there and find out what the water temperatures are in the different corners of the watershed, oh, where is it a refugio? Where might the maximum floating weekly average temperature be like under 62? Well, then you'll find coho, a proliferation of steelhead. And unless you save your refugia and get really conserve, uh, them, then you don't have sources for population, and if you restore in the future, you won't get the results you will. So the refugia are important to understand and then to target for protection. And we work closely with the Forest Service and BLM to do so. A little more challenging on private lands. And uh, here's uh, an example of a creek in recovery, Steelhead Creek, which had been underground at this location since the 64 flood. The sediment evolves from the system, and the next thing you know, it was wall to wall steelhead trout not far up from its convergence, a true refugia. Uh, this is Elder Creek on the Angelo Preserve. This is what the eel look like historically, lots of big wood. Uh, but uh, so these are, these are the places where, uh, that give the eel resilience. And there are uh, refugia scattered throughout the Eel River Basin. So even though there's an ecological crisis on the main stem in different places, uh, steelhead species uh, and others that uh, uh, have access to these refugia still thrive. And here's uh, water temperature data. And the interesting thing with this is it shows that um, we're not just concerned about maximum water temperature changes with climate change, but also with uh, reduction in temperature during cold spells in the winter. And so what you see here is that Elder Creek actually went uh, well below spawning temperatures of 42 degrees for many weeks in 2013-2014 uh, uh, because of severe drought and cold. And what we want to do is we want to get water temperature gauges 24-7, 365, so that we can get winter temperatures too. And we feed all our water temperature data to the uh, center for uh, in Utah, which is basically Forest Service, and they're tra trying to track climate change. This is Hiromi Uno graduate student, UC Berkeley, uh, standing on the ice of the South Fork Eel uh, back in uh, December uh, 2013. And, uh, but this is a major problem. Uh, many historical, uh, historically perennial streams are now intermittent, and this is Outlet Creek uh, in a location where it did not used to dry up. So uh, Outlet, 10 Mile, uh, also Tom Kai in Mendocino County, Salmon Creek, Redwood Creek, and Southern Humboldt. Uh, these are uh, seriously flow depleted, major problems. And here is uh, shots of Tomkai Creek going dry. And this is 10 Mile Creek, and you can see a lamprey juvenile has come up out of the gravel because as the stream expired, 
uh, so did the lamprey. So uh, big problem with, uh, with flow in the eel, no doubt about it. But the causal mechanism is not just extraction of marijuana, but also related to forest and watershed health. Quite a departure uh, from its historic hydrology. Uh, native species uh, all also suffer because of the introduction of non-natives, and lots of these species come out of ponds in the eel, and they set up shop temporarily, and they can cause some problems. But the uh, ones that stick, uh, like the Sacramento pike minnow, are the ones that are most uh, perturbing. And uh, here's some uh, dead fish in a jar from Redwood Creek uh, in uh, September 2013. So there are, there are definitely uh, substantiated problems. Uh, this is a creek that runs into the South Fork of the Eel around Miranda, and it is dry not because there isn't water coming from the watershed, but because it is buried so deeply in sediment. So aggradation, as the geologists say, can actually uh, make it so you have to dig for your water supply. You've got to keep the dirt on the hill. The Eel River Recovery Project annually puts out a map of where is the Eel River dry. And this is not related to running flow gauges. This is just eyewitness when we're out there. Uh, we see places and understand the hydrology, and we're able to help people understand where, where are the most serious problems in the eel. And um, that's, uh, you can see them on the map there. Some of those are a product of aggradation. Some of those are a product of water withdrawal and perturbed hydrology, and some are a combination of both. But by the time it hits the lower main eel or the south fork, uh, we're almost dried up. And because it gets so warm, it sets up algae blooms. And in some cases, those green algae blooms that are the good part of the ecosystem switch over to cyanobacteria, and then you've got problems because that can be toxic. And so um, we, uh, we do surveys throughout the eel and kind of try to peg that. And uh, let's see now. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is, uh, we also put uh, time-lapse cameras out there. And if you take a picture every 30 minutes with a Wingscapes time-lapse camera, you can actually make movies of the creek and show when it's dry and what it looks like at flood. And uh, while the, uh, the winter conditions, you're going, oh, there's plenty of water out there. But if it's a slurry of debris, uh, then it's not a healthy system. But here's Chamise Creek, for instance, in August of 2015. And you can see it's almost dried up. It's got a little trickle between pools. And here it is uh, in January uh, 2016, early in the year. Uh, that's not very turbid. That's a good sign of fairly decent health of Chamise Creek. Here's Chamise really rocking and rolling. And uh, on the night of January 17th, actually, uh, it turned the camera sideways and did not wash it away. But uh, we would like to get these movies in key locations in the eel, and particularly in basins where the creek's drying up, work with the public, and, uh, and the cannabis growers get them back on the surface and be able to show it in a movie. Uh, cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria is a worldwide problem. Uh, that uh, bottom right one is Lake Taihu in China. It's about the size of seven Lake Tahoes, 20 million people drinking bottled water. There's the ocean off the Sea of Florida, and that's because they shut off the Everglades, and now they put nutrient-enriched water off the sugarcane fields out there, it can give you Lou Gehrig's disease, it can give you uh, multiple sclerosis, it can give you different kinds of Alzheimer's. And the stuff on the eel, uh, on the left there, it looks fairly benign, but it can kill your dog in 15 minutes. It's a neurotoxin, anabina, produces anatoxin, dog rolls inside waters, dog gets stuff on fur, breaks open cells, dog licks fur, dog's paralyzed in 15 minutes. Uh, so the eel is uh, no longer uh, swimmable 365 days a year, and as a matter of fact, the flows on the South Fork eel are about a third of historic in an average flow year, and what results is uh, pretty noxious algae blooms, some of them toxic. In 2012, I didn't really know what we were doing, but I was just kind of checking it out, and we were lucky, and it was a wet year, and almost nothing happened. The following year... Um, and it was targeted by the citizens. They said it's not okay to have something that can kill our dogs. So let us know what to do. And they joined us in action to start to monitor. And then we really got some jet fuel in our tank with Keith Bulma Gregson from UC Berkeley. And he was able to, uh, to lead us to a basin-wide study that is now extended from 2013 to 2016. And we just successfully crowdfunded for money to do analysis of those data. And uh, UC Berkeley is a tremendous partner for the recovery project. 
uh, and that partnership goes well beyond uh, toxic cyanobacteria into the realm of fisheries, invasive, invasive species, uh, and we really cherish the uh, University of California as a partner. And so Keith Paul McGregson figured out that uh, volunteers could actually help him do this stuff. He would have to drive less if he solicited us. He helped us get organized. And uh, then we extended that further. That's Bruce Hillback Barger working, working with the Round Valley Indian tribes. So not only do we have a network of volunteers throughout the basin, we're also working with tribal governments. And um, big John Evans at Big Bend Lodge. His customers don't want toxic algae. John was insecure. We started monitoring, found out that his lodge is above the places that's uh, – that have problems, and that's the kind of partnerships that we would like to foster throughout the basin. And so this is where we put uh, toxic algae sensors. These are called SPATs, and the University of California at Santa Cruz actually does the, uh, the uh, measurements of uh, how much of the toxins are uh, absorbed by the resins. And uh, Keith Boma Gregson has uh, published a report that you could see at eelriverrecovery.org. And uh, we have a preliminary understanding of cyanobacteria in the eel. Uh, there is uh, the key culprit is down there at right, and that is uh, anabino. We know that's a, that's a major hitter, uh, but also uh, formidium and also uh, nostoc may be uh, significant players in different reaches of the river. And when you look at, let's see, did I skip one there? Okay, so here is uh, 2015 results, and you can see that um, Sproul Creek and Myers Flat, which are on the lower South Fork Eel, have the highest anatoxin A levels. Uh, surprisingly, Scotia in the lower eel later in the season showed significant toxic algae. We usually don't see toxic algae in the lower eel because it's in the marine climate re region. And then Dos Rios had a, uh, a positive reading and that's uh, well up on the, the main stem, and so that's out of the range of uh, where we thought we had a problem. So uh, we're, we're still in the early stages of data collection. And uh, this is uh, looking at uh, where we had positive hits and where we had uh, no hits at all. And so there's at least a little bit of anatoxin A uh, just about everywhere in the basin, uh, and uh, it's – it's there in different seasons, but it tends to peak uh, from late July through mid-September. And we put out fact sheets. We put out press releases. We feed public health departments in Mendocino and Humboldt. And we try to help the community cope with this new uh, and very dangerous uh, condition. Ultimately, we like to reverse that condition. Uh, and so that's, that's, you know, but that's a long ways off. But we want a trend monitor. Uh, between now and then uh, and do this annually because we, it, you can't afford to fly blind with something that can kill your dog. And we also want to do, uh, is it swimmable? Because, you know, when the river is beautiful, it should be celebrated. It's good for quality of life. It's good for community health. And so we want to get people to send us Facebook pictures when it's swimming season and have some fun with that, as well as the flip side, which is uh, take your dog to the ocean beach, not to the river. And uh, this is a project near and dear to my heart, the Fall Chinook Project. And uh, annually, we put uh, teams of divers into the Lower Eel River, and we synchronize swim to uh, count the salmon. And then we will chase them in kayaks in low-flow years when we can watch them spawn in the Lower River. And otherwise, we uh, have a network of volunteers way up in the headwaters, and they will call us as the uh, pulses of fish move around. And we're able to get a pretty good understanding of uh, the levels of population annually, and they've ranged from 30 to 50,000 in 2012 to more recently to 10 to 15,000. This year we bounced back to about 15 to 30,000, so that's still a lot of wild salmon and a reason for hope in the eel. Uh, in 2015, water quality problems finally caught up with the adult Chinook. Usually they come in after it rains and water quality problems are abated. But they went blind in the Lower Eel River while holding, waiting for rain in 2015 because of parasitization of their eye by a flatworm host. And we believe that has to do with uh, a proliferation of a non-native snail. Uh, so there's uh, all these interesting different uh, ecological effects that we're seeing as we get a chance to hang out and study things further. Here's your fall Chinook trends, and I didn't get a chance to update this, but uh, 
We're back double in 2016, 15 to 30,000, and that's because they shut off ocean fisheries, and um, there's been pretty good recruitment from the eel in recent brood years. And uh, it's just electric when you get in the water with several hundred Chinook salmon. Uh, it's uh, it's a it's an unforgettable experience. So we generate a lot of uh, enthusiasm when we are able to put people in the water on these dives. And you know, really, the test of sustainability going forward is you know, will our creeks look like the one on the right, nutrient enriched to the point where it's uh, far in exceedance of uh, EPA standards for chlorophyll per square meter, for instance. And the other is uh, one with significant public lands, but also better stewardship, uh, McCoy Creek. So that's your historic condition. And the one on the right is uh, kind of an ecological unraveling. And, of course, uh, the next step from that is that the creek is dry. And so we started to work, uh, you know, really we confirmed our hypotheses. So in 2015, we won a grant with the State Water Resources Control Board from the Cleanup and Abatement Account. And uh, we went out and we visited 70 cannabis farms. And we provided technical assistance at those cannabis farms, linked up with more cannabis farmers in terms of citizen monitoring, and also uh, held many different public events and uh, really did a lot of education. Uh, we put together uh, videos, uh, which are available at eelriverrecovery.org. And um, really, it's, uh, it was a phenomenal success. Uh, we had uh, high turnout at our public meetings. Uh, we did model farm tours, which uh, taught lessons in sustainability. Uh, we had uh, some of the best people uh, in the eel in terms of professional capacity uh, for best practices training as our emissaries, and they were extremely well received uh, by, uh, by the cannabis community. And we're looking for uh, phase two to go back out there and see if we can do better. We collected data on an anonymous basis, and uh, most of the people aren't using water meters, they don't have overflow valves for their um, their water tanks, and so we really need to improve. And this is uh, uh, Noah Cornell uh, was one of our outreach people in the southern uh, eel in Mendocino, and uh, Noah is a soil fertility specialist, and you could go online and learn how to make uh, compost tea from Noah. And uh, this is really the key for getting into harmony with nature uh, for the cannabis growers, and actually for anybody else that's uh, living on steep, unstable rural ground in northwestern California. Slow spread and sink your water. It, it'll be a sponge. If you have your roads with gullies, they're going to gully to China. It's eight pounds a gallon on the wrong night. You're going to lose real estate. Prevent erosion from roads. Decommission, recontour, and really prevent crossing failures. That's your big enchilada. Practice permaculture to store water. You can create a, a ditch in a hillside or a depression and fill it with humus, and uh, then you can you can dry farm, or you can use a lot less water. Uh, build living soils. You know that's really the key to it. It's like plants co-evolved with mycelia. You get a mushroom compost going. You're going to use about one third to one tenth the water. Forest health is a big deal. We whack the whole eel, 60, 70 percent of it. And now we find that 40 to 60 year old trees are a lot more thirsty than old growth forest, so we got to thin from below. We got to go back to the more normal range of variability. If farmers do that, they're going to get less fungus on their crop. They're going to have less fire risk of burning up. Their forest is going to evolve in a way that's uh, more beneficial uh, in many other regards. Create a water budget. Practice conservation. Increase water storage. Fill during appropriate seasons. Be careful of where you build ponds what life forms you put in them, go organic, prevent pollution by storing hazardous materials safely, and work with your neighbors to achieve solutions so the water should scale. And that's what we intend to do in phase two. Uh, restoring the balance, um, you know, this is really about forest health. Uh, we have uh, made profound changes in the ecosystem as a result of the changes in forest age, and we need to um, really look to that and take every measure that we can to restore watershed hydrology. Grasslands, for, interest, for instance, have uh, diminished in terms of their water storage capacity in the eel tremendously. So uh, there's another whole realm for us to, uh, to study and to uh, maybe do some good in terms of restoring grasslands. It's about 20% of the eel basin. And all life is interconnected. And, you know, if you work with nature, you're rewarded. You work against nature, she's going to play tricks on you. 
So the eelriverrecovery.org online, and uh, I want to see 100,000 salmon in the 21st century. We'll take some questions. At last year's SFS, the Society for Freshwater Science Conference that was held here in Sacramento, there were two different presentations given on the use of camera traps for monitoring and taking a look at the stream. And I noticed that you, you, know, you spoke on that as well. Uh, one of the presenters loved it and had a great experience uh, actually showing flows changing and that you could actually go out there and put a gauge and measure those flows, but the presentation was never uploaded, um, and that person's no longer with the university, so uh, can't get a hold of him. The other presenter gave a really poor uh, presentation on how to use those camera traps. Uh, could you share with us your setup and, and, and the value that you're getting out of using those camera traps? Yeah, actually, uh, we call them time-lapse cameras. And uh, the brand that I use is called Wingscapes, and they cost, you know, $99, which is pretty affordable. So under our state board grant, we got 10. And um, they are fairly easily affixed to, uh, to trees. They have these adapters or to, um, you know, you can drive a, a you know, fence pole. And then you basically just set it up, and you put 6C-cell batteries in it, and you put a 32-gigabyte chip, and I set it for 2 megapixels every 30 minutes, and you change the day length depending on the time of year. And then right now we're going like 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock, and I download, and if people go to eelriverrecovery.org and hit the Vimeo channel, and you go through the videos there, we're not very organized yet because this is kind of something we juggled in on top of everything else. Uh, but um, there's a few glitches. Uh, we lost two. Uh, one, one we think was dislodged by a bear. The other was placed too close to the stream. Uh, and uh, we also had one shut off in the middle of summer last year on Chemise, which is too bad because Chemise didn't go dry. And our objective was to, uh, to make sure that we documented if there was significant changes in flow. So now we're going to be more frequent in terms of our changing of chips and batteries in order to uh, avoid such, uh, you know, kind of malfunction. But also, Eric, what we want to do is be able to download some of these cameras more in real time as creeks approach getting dry and then put it out to the community. It's time for you to what they call forbear, and that is to run off your stored water and not to further withdraw water from the creek. And there's um, there's a lot of benefit in that, and there's a there's a – project on the upper Matoll where they've had a great deal of success with cooperation with the community. So uh, the, the video from the cameras is uh, when you buy the camera, the time-lapse video that compresses the, the pictures into a, a, a movie uh, comes with it. And uh, if you have your day length set wrong, it's better for you to go through there and take the ones that are black out of your raw photos before you amalgamate them. So there's your time-lapse camera. How many hours of training did volunteers need? Um, well, see, that, that depends on the level of the responsibility that they wish to take. Uh, many of the volunteers uh, really, I'm the guy. I come out with the water temperature gauges. I show them how to do it. Uh, the key thing is, will they pull it from me before it washes away? And because, you know, when you're operating at the 3,600-square-mile basin and the climatic variability is increasing, uh, the risk of loss of gear is, uh, is pretty challenging. Uh, for people like David Sopchis, who was uh, operating uh, the UC spats down in the Lower Eel River and also collecting nutrient sampling, uh, he had many hours of training directly from Keith Bulma Gregson. Uh, and uh, in our volunteer dives, uh, we have people coming back year after year, so we have they now have accumulated, you know, 100 or more hours of uh, direct observation, and they're getting really good at it. They're getting as good, I think, as, uh, as people who get paid to do it for a living. And uh, the, we actually train on the fly a lot uh, because we can't, you know, we don't give people in the hall from all over the basin because it's too far for them to travel although we do benefit greatly from participating in joint sessions like the UC Algal Foray, which is held biannually, and we've had uh, several people now um, trained to the point that they can 
identify toxic algae for the community, and so we have places where people can bring samples. So that's a case where our uh, our toxic algae team they got a lot of training, and um, and they're they're really uh, proficient. Uh, with the false chinook dyes, it's pretty interesting. You know, humans are pack animals. You put people in a line. You put a couple of people, you know, uh, that are experienced around your novice divers. And if they're going to get it, they're going to be good pretty quick. Uh, but, you know, in estimating large numbers of adult fish going by at 35 miles an hour, it takes uh, several times uh, through the pools to, to get the knack. Uh, and so we always have, uh, we pair experienced people with non-experience in that realm. But uh, let's see, and so a lot of my training is one-on-one, -on -one, and as people kind of call me, then they come, oh, yeah, and uh, oh, we just did pike minnow dives, which is a non-native invasive predator we're also trying to track. I didn't mention it, but uh, in that particular exercise, we drew uh, divers from UC Berkeley. We had uh, divers that are professional fisheries biologists, and then like three of our our dive team that have been doing uh, Chinook diving since 2012. So uh, we, we really are able to assemble crack teams on the fish count stuff. Uh, the temperature stuff really requires volunteer coordinators that are plugged in and not very much from volunteers. And then the spat and the, the toxic algae stuff, that requires more training. I'd say each, you know, each person gets like six hours training before uh, we turn them loose. All right, th thanks, Pat. We had a, another question regarding uh, the help that you receive from UC Santa Cruz. Could you explain that? Oh, yeah. Ron Cadella at uh, UC Santa Cruz is the expert. He devised the SPAT. And I'm sorry that I'm not, I should be able to do that acronym for you. But it's a resin technology, and uh, the uh, you put the devices out for varying lengths of time. If you want detailed data, you do it weekly. Otherwise, we do it monthly. And then we freeze those samples, and then we send them to UC Berkeley, and then they process them through alcohol, I understand, to fix them. And then they send them to UC Santa Cruz, and UC Santa Cruz has been able to do uh, anatoxin A and microcystin from the spats and give us quantitative data. And so that indicates we don't have microcystin to any degree. That's the one that plagues the Klamath River and many reservoirs to the north of us. Uh, but we do have anatoxin A. And uh, UC Berkeley and Santa Cruz, uh, really the reason they've stayed with us now, we're going to have to figure out how to bring more monetary resources to the table. But the reason they've stayed with us is because you just don't see uh, toxic algae problems in rivers very much. So they were uh, fascinated by it, and we've had... Uh, a uh, tremendous uh, good fortune that they are uh, they're doing this year's samples as well and but I'm not sure about a permanent arrangement uh, it's probably going to have to be some uh, compensation for us to maintain that into the future oh it's solid phase absorption to toxin tracking spat with two T's thank you Kristen I appreciate everyone's attention and I really appreciate the uh, the opportunity, Eric, for uh, for me to share. Uh, it's a great deal of uh, pleasure for me to work with the citizens of the EEL, and I think we're uh, we're doing something that's very worthwhile.